Welcome everyone, salam, and thank you for being with us today for our exciting round table on religion and feminism, Muslim, saints, and Jewishness in Latin America and the Caribbean. My name is Alia Khan, and I'm director of the University of Michigan Global Islamic Studies Center, which is your host today. I'm also an associate professor in the Department of English and the Department of Afro-American and African Studies at U of M. First, a little about us and our center. The Global Islamic Studies Center aims to promote the understanding of global Islamic culture and Muslim societies worldwide, not just the Middle East, but Asia, Africa, and the Americas. If you are a Michigan student wanting to get involved with our center, please attend our events. But also, if you're an undergraduate student, declare our Islamic Studies minor. The minor itself has no prerequisites and is 16 credits. You can find more information on our minor page on our website, but please reach out and contact us and we can make sure that you have everything you need. If you're interested in graduate programs, check out our Masters in International and Regional Studies with an Islamic Studies specialization. The application deadline is mid-December and you can again find info on our website the master's program is 36 credits total and is usually pursued over the course of two years. This semester, Global Islamic Studies just finished our fourth annual Halloween Muslim Horror Film Festival, featuring horror films from Malaysia, Indonesia, Senegal, and Turkey. The festival was covered in Religion News, American Muslim Today, and other media outlets. Today's author roundtable is our final event this semester. Next semester in winter 2023, we have two exciting events to look forward to. Our very first African Muslim Film Festival featuring films curated from Sudan, Chad, South Africa, Egypt, and more. In early March, we will also be launching a new book by Professor Charlotte Karim Albrecht, Possible Histories, Arab Americans and the queer ecology of peddling. If you are a student, faculty member, staff, or community member interested in our events, please make sure you join our newsletter and keep up with us on social media, on our Twitter and our Facebook. We send out a monthly newsletter um, to which you can subscribe. We'll put the link in the chat. I would like to take a minute to thank our co-sponsors of the event today. This author roundtable on religion and feminism is brought to you by the Global Islamic Studies Center and co-sponsored at the University of Michigan by the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Our external co-sponsors are Rutgers University Press and Oxford University Press, which publish the books we're discussing today. The presses are offering everyone who's here today 30% off the speaker's books. We'll put the codes in the chat, but quickly, here it is for Dr. William Calvo Quiroz's book, Undocumented Saints, The Politics of Migrating Devotions. Next, uh, for my book, Far From Mecca, Globalizing the Muslim Caribbean. And then for Dr. Jocelyn Fenton Stitt's book, Dreams of Archives Unfolded, Absence and Caribbean Life Writing. And finally, for our moderator, Dr. Ken Chitwood's recent book, The Muslims of Latin America and the Caribbean. And don't worry, we're putting those codes in the chat. So on to the main event. I'm gonna introduce our moderator and then he'll take it from here, from there. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ken Chitwood, a religion scholar and journalist with a focus on Islam and Muslims in the Americas, Christian Muslim relations, global Christianity, Muslim Minorities and Ethnographic Methods, and Manifestations of Religion Beyond Religion in a Global and Digital Age. Dr. Chitwood is currently conducting research on ethnographic journalism with the University of Southern California Center for Religion and Civic Culture's Engaged Spirituality Project and on Latinx Muslim Philanthropy with the Muslim Philanthropy Institute at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at IUPUI. He is the author of the award-winning book, The Muslims of Latin America and the Caribbean, published in 2021, and, on, and the under-review, American Muslims, 
Everyday Cosmopolitanism Among Puerto Rican Converts to Islam. Dr. Chitwood is a 2022 recent winner of the Best In-Depth News Writing Award from the American Academy of Religion. So Ken, I'll turn it over to you now with thanks. Thank you very much. What a joy it is to be here and be moderating this evening at an event that puts three books into conversation. And to start that conversation this evening, we're going to have the authors of the books themselves speak to us about their work. And our first is going to be Dr. William A. Cavalqueros. Dr. Cavalqueros is an assistant professor of American culture and Latinx studies at the University of Michigan. He holds a PhD in Chicano and Chicano studies from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a PhD from the Department of Architecture and Environmental Design at Arizona State University. His research investigates the relationship between state violence, imagination, religiosity, and spirituality along the US-Mexico border region during the 20th century. He looks at this region not only as a socio-political space of conflict and struggle, but as a 2000 mile strip of haunted land inhabited by many imaginary creatures, vernacular saints and fantastic tales, all of them expressions of the sophisticated subversive epistemic traditions in the region. He also studies the evolution and the politics of surveillance and control around Latino religiosity. Dr. Cavacoros's book, Undocumented Saints, The Politics of Migrating Devotions, which he'll be speaking about just shortly, follows the migration of popular saints from Mexico into the US and the evolution of their meaning. The book explores how Latinx battles for survival are performed in the worlds of faith, religiosity, and the imaginary, and how the socio-political realities of exploitation and racial segregation frame their popular religious expressions. Dr. Cavacoros's areas of interest also include Chicana, Chicano, Mexican American aesthetics, design and urban planning, Chicana feminist and decolonial methodologies, and the power of empathy and forgiveness to formulate new racial, gender, and sensual discourses. You can find more about his research and teaching at variology.com, which I think will also be shared in the chat. So you can click directly on that link. Dr. Cavicoros, we look forward to hearing about your work. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can share. Um, I think I need uh, authorization to share. Let's see here. <clears throat> Can you see it, everybody? Good. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for inviting me. It's very exciting to have this book in conversation. A um, few things here. Uh, let me see here. First of all, I want to start with, um, with a little piece, prayer, of a booklet that many immigrants carry with them when they cross the border into the United States from Latin America. And it's go like this. God, at this moment, I'm at the border, determined to go through. I know that it's against the law, but you know well that I do not do it to define the regulation of a nation, the economic reality in which I find myself in a desperate search for a better future for my family make me cross over without the necessary documentation. I feel like I am a citizen of the world and a member of a shell who had no border. This document was created by the Diocese of uh, San Juan de los Lagos, of, uh, close to uh, Guadalajara. And it carry out many different prayers along the pro could describe all the process of migration from a prayer for the moment that you make the decision to leave your family behind, the moment that you get to the border, the moment that you need to look for a job, and even the painful moment when, it, when you find that you're going to be deported or you arrive to your homeland back. Um, in many ways, my central question is how the religious experience migrates and how migration transformed religiously. Um, I always say that this project is very political and religious, and religious at the same time. It really contexts because my family lived in Arizona and at one point was the law SB 1070. And one of the awful parts of this one was that it, it was really a, a process of terror against Latinos. So uh, me and my, my family and I, we went to uh, uh, an event to as a volunteers uh, we help people to transfer uh, custody uh, rights for somebody in their family in case that they get deported. And at the end of the event, there was a little prayer event. And there, 
in the chapel and this one happened in a church uh, in part because people feel that the church will be safe. Uh, there was a sculptor of a saint that I didn't know. And so I asked my mom, my mom said, oh, that's to review Romo, the saint of people without documentation. So that's how this project began, right at the intersection of religiosity and the politics uh, and migration. So my book is divided in four different chapters. Uh, the first one uh, talk about Jesus Malverde. Uh, the second one is about the case of Olga Camacho and Juan Castillo, or Juan Soldado. Uh, the third one is Santoribio Romo, who is this one who appears in the border and help people to cross. And then the last one is La Santa Muerte. They have been organized in this order based in some kind of chronology based on the moment where their devotion became more popular. Uh, because as you will see with the Santa Muerte, and there may be argument that, that her devotion come to way before uh, the 20th century, but really it's only into the 20, in the, in the 2000s that we see really the emergence of this devotion. So I organized this in the chronology of how they became part of mainstream uh, popularity. For me, one of the big question is, and I, and I like that I'm in this panel, is where the United States begins and ends and when Latin America begins and ends. As you see, we have 62 million of Latinos in the United States and the boundaries between one and the other do not exist. You know, so in many ways, uh, my book is about the experience of how religiosity creates some kind of crisis for the states or for these kind of imaginations of the states as, as the states trying to regulate how people or what people believe. Um, one of the other interesting things that I'm trying to explore is in this kind of process of migration, how the communities are able to build a piece of their nation, let's say Mexico or Venezuela, that is held together, not just by culture, but also by religious practice. You know, I call them interreligious states, and there are very unique forms of religiosity who are very much tied to the politics of migration and the experience of displacement that these people experience. In the way that the religious practice, the events that they happen, the devotion, do more than just uh, keep a religion, but it's also teach people what it means to be Mexican, what it means to be an immigrant, what it means to be different. Uh, I'm very interested in seeing this devotion within the context of the many different events, historical events and political events that happen between the United States and in this case, Mexico, because all these things uh, and the devotion are from Mexico and have moved into the United States. And then later on, we will see how, how some of those go back to Mexico, transform after being in the United States. So the first one is Jesus Malverde. Um, it is a very interesting case because we don't even know if Jesus Malverde even existed. Um, what we know is that for the most part, is framed within the period of Porfirio Diaz and the uh, governor of uh, Culiacán. And you may have heard Culiacán because it's a famous capital of, of the cartel of Culiacán. Uh, but what is interesting is that because we don't know if the person even existed, there are no images. And during the 1980s, there is an interesting moment when the person who is leading this kind of religious group go into some kind of marketing crisis. And they decide to take the face of Pedro Infante, uh, the, uh, one of the most important uh, actors and singer of this period, uh, who is also for the same state, and put it, the face of, this, of, of him into the imagery for the same. You know, so there is all these studies about what it did it happen, but also uh, what it that means for the construction. This is a picture of the current chapel or um, the main chapel of his verde. And here I studied the politics of, of selling objects, renting the space, and the many different objects and things that people left behind. In the way that for me, these religious uh, shrines and chapels became a social archive you know, all the drama or the everyday that these people need to incur, you know? So when I go there, you, you can see, you know, this drama, the, the move from, uh, for decades. And interesting in the politics of, of the economy of, of sainthood, who, who sell, who produce, uh, who is able to have access to those objects and the religious things that they do with them. Um, but I'm also very interested in how the United States imagine uh, Latinos, in this case, through the representation of the saints in mainstream. So in this case, um, from the uh, TV show Breaking Bad, uh, you had the image of, of Jesus Malverde because he had been consistently linked with the narco traffickers. 
Now, as I say in my book, he is the same of this particular region. So for me, it's interesting to understand how narco-capitalism emerged in this particular region and how it is tied later on with the religious or of, of this uh, of this same. But as well as all the production at uh, uh, Telemundo just produced last year a telenovela called Jesus Malverde based in the story of, of Jesus Malverde, but it's also the controversy around the TV show of this novella uh, because the main character, the person, the actor who was supposed to perform uh, the, the saying, uh, he need, need to withdraw at one point because the allegation that he was gay and the cartels were against him, a gay person performing the local saying. So for me, this chapter is all about the construction of masculinity uh, in the period after the Mexican Revolution. The second uh, case is Olga Camacho and Juan Castillo. It's a very interesting case because it's based on the story of uh, the consisting killing and violence against women along the US-Mexico border. Uh, it's based on the case of Olga Camacho, an eight-year-old girl who disappeared in 1938. Uh, and then uh, this is a little map of where the family was located. The events happened, that the mother sent the daughter to buy some uh, groceries in a, in a grocery store very close by. The girl disappeared. And you can see here a few things that are interesting is that US-Mexico border is very close and it will remain close to the law, to the story of her disappearance and their veneration. But the interesting thing is the main suspect is a soldier, uh, Juan Castillo. Um, and, and what is interesting thing is that despite all the things that happened, and he, at one point he get killed um, through a, a lynch, um, he is the one who became the, the saint in the story, not Olga. So for me, it became a possibility to study how violence against women happen also through our religious practices. You know, what an interesting thing is that once she uh, disappeared and people start looking for, people went into the streets, there was riots that included, uh, you know, the burnt of the, of the city hall and the fort. Uh, one of the things that is interesting is that from the beginning, it was very clear that people were saying, well, there is some story behind the murder of this, of this child. There is something else. And in this case, and I studied all the politics among the riots, the family of Olga, the family of Juan Soldado, the circumstances who make that crime uh, not exceptional, but actually part of a long history of violence against women. You know, um, he got buried, uh, but eight months after, people start to venerate him over Olga. You know, and to the point that the uh, Camacho family, the family of Olga, is forced to. Uh, take the remains of Olga out of the cemetery and move into another cemetery because people attending the grave of Juan Soldado was attacking the family as they are, as well as Olga Camacho grave. So for me, this is a good example of how the violence against women remain even after the person have death. Uh, death. And this is an image of uh, uh, Olga Camacho grave, uh, completely uh, forgetting there is no uh, picture, there is no images, there is nothing really that represent uh, in the in the popular imaginary that she is the actual victim. You know, so he then studied the politics of the different groups that are involved, uh, the politics uh, around the case, and then also that many objects, letters, um, and exposures that people left behind in the grave, in the way that. Um, you can trace the drama of that community, of a border community, just by studying the object that they left behind. I mean, before the, um, the mortgage crisis became mainstream issue in the United States, we already have seen people requesting, please help me to save my house. You know, so, um, so for me, at the very important, and, and in this chapter, we have an analysis of uh, a feminist intervention of a group of artists who decide to create uh, little uh, stamps with prayers to res resurrect Olga and to create kind of fake miracles around her to uh, bring into. So in the, in the way that Olga Camacho have emerged now as a saint to protect women along the border against the violence of the state, uh, predominantly the, um, the military um, and Americans who go into the other side. The third chapter is uh, Toribio Romo, 
who is, like I say, this particular priest, a Catholic priest, is the only saint that I have in my book that is actually have been canonized. And remember, I use the term saint here, and I'm not referring to holiness. You know, holiness is a, is a characteristic that many cultures and religions recognize in an individual, um, that we honor, you know, the, uh, the bravery of somebody who rescued their life to, to save a child. Or, or, the, or the father or mother who sacrificed themselves to protect some, uh, their kids. Uh, so holiness has been uh, uh, recognized everywhere. In this case, I talk about saints as this kind of cultural objects and the meanings that people attach to these particular uh, uh, moving, changing, flexible objects, okay? So, but in the case of, of, of uh, Turibio Rome, it's very interesting because around the 1990s, people start claiming that the spirit of the River Romo appears to people as they try to cross the border. And the narrative always go in very similar way. Uh, this person is trying to cross, this individual comes, sometimes a pickup, sometimes walking, sometimes it provides transportation or water or directions. And when the person say, I'm sorry, I cannot pay you for what you did, he say, oh, don't worry. When you have time, go back to my town in Santana, you know, in Jalisco and give respects. And of course, years after, the person is able to go or allows or, or ask somebody to do it for them if they cannot leave the United States. And when they get there, they find out that the person, it has been dead for a long time, is actually Toribu Romo, the, the, the saint, the local saint. And he died during the Cristero War, a conflict between the Mexican state and the Catholic Church. Um, this is a picture of the town of Santana. And here uh, it's allowed me to study a phenomenon that I call uh, a saint or returned, you know, how the experience of those immigrants who have come into the United States have a direct impact going back into, into Mexico in the way that uh, Mexico have an influence in the religiosity of the United States because of migration, but the United States by the experience of living here and be exposed to, you know, uh, uh, cultural realities, people then go back and transform this place. So this little town who normally had just 300 people living there, turn into 30,000 people who visit the site uh, uh, during the weekends, okay? So hidden interesting in what we call religious tourism, but also why, despite the fact that we have so many people going there, the quality of life of these individuals had not necessarily increased, in part because of the control that the Catholic Church have over the means of, 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 um, of creating wealth in this town, okay? And I study also the politics regarding the traveling of relics in the form of pieces of bond who were uh, coming to the United States in the 2000s. And you guys remember, there was all the discussion of uh, immigration reform. Part of the process of the re uh, immigration reform was also this kind of traveling of, of, of relics of the same for migrants. Uh, who was mobilized people and, and create these kind of communities of veneration around them. You know, so for example, the first case is uh, in Chicago, in Santa Agnes, uh, who is also manifest the deep transformation that the Catholic Church has experienced because of migration. Here is a group called the Toribio Romo Society that during the elections take as their mission, almost a spiritual mission, to uh, go to mass in the morning. And after that, they go into the side of the town to register. And they say, many of these people without documentation, they cannot vote, of course, but we need to find those Americans who can make a difference. So they go and register, you know? So it's very much about this kind of uh, a practice of religiosity who transform the political side. This the other side is uh, here in Detroit, 45 minutes of an arbor. Uh, and his Holy Redeemer, who is a very interesting case. And this is uh, uh, Reverend Donald Hamro, who is now an auxiliary bishop, but at one point was the, uh, the priest responsible for Holy Redeemer. And he talked about how the church was uh, dismantling. Now, this is part of a transformation that happened because of migration. Um, there was Polish community, they left the town, and then Mexican started to move in. Uh, and this church have not was able yet to evolve or transform or adapt to the new communities. And he talked about, and the roof was, it was coming down. He went to pray for us for a miracle and he's leaving. He found a little stamp with the image of Toribio Romo. He go and talk with the Paris secretary that of course is a Latina and she's playing who he is. And because of that, it's scattered on a huge event that ended with the uh, bringing a relics 
and the creation of an icon. Uh, and, I, and here in the book, I talk about all these kind of politics of bringing the relics, but also in this particular parish, the conflict that it created with the community when this icon was produced, because the community was very upset that the icon, he looked so dark. So I talk about how the religious uh, experiences of pigmentocracy or how uh, race uh, and whiteness is presented in the representation of science and how these people are particularly invested in that to review Romo need to be a white person, you know? And the other case is the case of Tulsa. Um, this is a very interesting case because again, it's framed within the case of transformation created for migration, but also the racial tensions around the religious church, you know? Um, this is an image of the altar in the one that you have in your left, is the altar in Jalisco, in the Church of La Lomita in Santa Ana, who is where the original remains of Toribio Romo are located. And the one in your right is the one created here in the United States in Tulsa. I call this phenomenon the mural altar. So uh, because in the context of these people who had done this promise to go back and visit the site in Jalisco, remember it's part of Amanda of a contract, a religious contract that people do asking a saint for a, for a favor. The problem is that you don't have documentation in the United States. You cannot go to Mexico to fulfill your promise. So it is in this context that the creation of an altar, who use materials for the, from Jalisco, but an architect from Jalisco and follow the same aesthetics and form, it creates some kind of a teletransportation, we will say, you know, to make it easy, easy for people. It's a place when you can go here in the United States without leave the United States and fulfill your manda. And the manda, it is carried, you know, by this kind of spiritual side and uh, into the, the right location. So they were very interested in secure that they use materials and architects and that they follow the same aesthetic. And here you don't see it, but there is also a relic of the same and a big sculpture of the same. One of the big events that are important in this community is the construct is the creation of a, a grand cavalgata, a horse um, parade uh, that go from one side of the town to the other side of the town. Now, remember, uh, I forget here to say that uh, this uh, devotion come to exist also in the context of another law who was trying to uh, prevent people um, who was attacking Latino immigrants. So that comes, the creation of this kind of pilgrimage event go through from some older, uh, uh, more influenced, uh, more white uh, neighbors in, in Tulsa. So it creates this kind of tension, racial tension for a day as the people are blocked the street and they go from one church to the other. But of course, in the country of the United States, they cannot stop this event because it's a religious event, okay? So here is an image of the of the, of the, of the biggest culture that, that they carry on. And the last chapter uh, in just few minutes is La Santa Muerte. And in this one, in this particular, uh, a very interesting ones, the evolution and the tensions and the politics to claim that the Santa Muerte is an ancient uh, veneration in the context of a secular state, in the way that if you frame the Santa Muerte as an indigenous, uh, it created a different space for existing within the, the Mexican state. Okay, so uh, there is a lot of controversy uh, about uh, really if the, if the Santa Muerte devotion is the, the one that we have in the pre-colonial period, it is the same one that we have today. Uh, my position is that it's not, despite the connection that people made done because of the iconography with the Dia de los Muertos, you know, and this is one of the big things. Uh, help people to understand that La Santa Muerte and the other Muertos are not the same. Uh, very much uh, my research focuses also in what we call the neoliberal period, who is based on after uh, 2001 when Enriqueta Romero opened a chapel in her home. And I followed the evolution of the Santa Muerte International, a group who have many chapters uh, here in the United States. And I'm interested also in how, when I talk with them, they construct the story of La Santa Muerte within Christianity, in the way that they carve from a space, you know, and they say that Santa Muerte is the, the, the saint who was originally in the Garden of Eve, and is the one who will be at the end of time when, is the, 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 when Jesus come the second time. You know, so in the way that there is no conflict of, be a follower of La Santa Muerte and be Catholic. The, the church as an institution prohibit Catholics 
to follow the veneration, but for them, there is no conflict. So you can hope to service on the Santa Muerte on Saturday and then have service with the mass on Sunday. Uh, one of the sites that I study is in Queens, New York, and it's a huge event led by the uh, transgender community. Uh, it is a long event, uh, for example, that go uh, from six to three in the mornings and just forgive you, it have prayers, uh, that, you know, for example, against uh, a president at the time, 45, they have dance, they have prayers, they have an academic lecture or somebody coming from Mexico, they have mariachis, they have healing prayers, dinner, and then folklorical, more prayers, a dry queen show, a showing of a film and prayer. So it became an event that it constructs uh, a piece of Mexico is very much look like a quinceañera, really. Uh, that is very interesting because it's a quinceañera or la Santa Muerte in, uh, in the South Asia um, Indian uh, hall. So it's a very interesting. It is polluted, it's full of people who are taking pictures and images. And then also look at how the representation of the Santa Muerte is taking place in the United States today in the way that uh, it, it framed um, Latinos as this kind of uh, bloodthirsty uh, killers. Uh, so few things, uh, I end the, the book with an analysis again in Phoenix, I'm beginning in Phoenix, I end in Phoenix, um, particularly the case of, of a, a parish who, who is now the, the, the main church for the Catholic church and how Latinos were expelled from there and they were forced to build another church after the priest told them that they need to have mass in the, in the basement. And then I ended with an analysis about how these kind of issues of race and religiosity uh, affect this community. Of the 10 parishes, or the 11 parishes in Phoenix who are uh, focusing on Latino community, or the, or the 11 Latino parishes in Phoenix, 10 of them have priests who have been accused of sexual abuse, who, have, uh, who have, were accused in another parish, and the bishop moved them to Latino parishes. So, so I tried to look at the context of how this uh, violence you know, against the Latino uh, uh, is perpetrated even today by the moving of priests who have committed crimes particular to our community. You know, so just to end it, uh, the notion that many, many of these categories of religious or secular are really insufficient when we study many of these cultural phenomena, uh, that the spiritual are always very much raw material that help us to understand the unfolding drama of every day within Latinos and the discourses about religiosity um, are for the most part epistemic discourses because they had to do with power and knowledge. And that in my case and the community that I study, the spiritual is always political, you know, uh, because you cannot disassociate the life of people from the reality of the religious experience. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. I'm looking forward for your questions um, and, and to see what everybody has to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cabo Quiroz. That was a wonderful presentation. Love your visuals. And uh, I have questions that already started popping to the top of my mind, but we're going to hold off uh, for those later. If any of those attending have questions, you're more than welcome to start posting them in the q and I'll be paying attention there uh, and I can start uh, collecting them and documenting them for later. So feel free to post those in the Q&A uh, for later if they come to you in the middle of the presentations. For our next presentation, we have Dr. Alia Khan. Dr. Khan is an associate professor in the University of Michigan Department of Afro-American and African Studies and the Department of English Language and Literature. She's also director of the Global Islamic Studies Center at the International Institute. Dr. Khan specializes in post-colonial Caribbean literature and the contemporary literature of the Muslim and Islamic worlds with a focus on the intersections of race, gender, and Islam in the hemispheric Americas, including immigrant communities in North America. She has also presented and taught widely in the field of Muslim representation in comics and graphic novels, and is on the editorial board of Bloomsbury's Critical Guides in Comics Studies. Dr. Khan's book, Far From Mecca, Globalizing the Muslim Caribbean, is the first academic monograph on the literature, history, and music of Caribbean Islam, focusing on Guyana, Trinidad, and Jamaica, and on enslaved Muslim West Africans, indentured Indian colonial sugar plantation laborers, and their Muslim Caribbean descendants. Far From Mecca garnered three national awards, honorable mention in the 2020-2021 Modern Language Association Prize for a First Book, 
the 2018-2019 American Comparative Literature Association's Helen Tartar First Book Subvention Award, and the 2017-2018 American Association of University Women Postdoctoral Research National Fellowship Award. Congratulations on all those awards, Dr. Khan. We look forward to hearing more about your work. Thank you so much, Ken, for that generous introduction and William for your amazing slides and the breadth of your research. I have lots of questions for you too. Um, a minute. Okay. This talk, so this talk is on the book, Far From Mecca, Globalizing the Muslim Caribbean, which is the first academic monograph on the history, literature, politics, and music of the Anglophone Caribbean. So here's the book in its 2020 Rutgers University Press US edition, and its University of the West Indies Press Caribbean and World edition. Since we're talking about gender difference, I think you can see the gender difference in covers. The US Rutgers edition on the left features a photo of Muslim women in British Guyana on the eve of independence. And the photo includes my maternal grandmother and my mother and aunt as children. The right is a little more general. Um, it's also a mosque in Guyana in the same time period with a kind of a palm tree to signify Caribbean. Those choices were made by the presses, but they are my photos, um, family archival photos from Guyana. I think that these covers tell a different gendered and generational story about the contents of the text. To me, the left suggests something about becoming in a soon to be post-colonial nation, and the right says something about religious preservation and maintenance. Today, I'll in examine the ways in which changing norms of Muslim women's dress are read. And in the 21st century Anglophone Caribbean, where race is historically linked to religion, I make two major arguments. First, that in the contemporary era, Islam is framed in the Caribbean, not as a local religion with a long history in the region, but, it, but as a foreign transnational religion characterized by local adherence, gendered participation in a contemporary global Islam. As in North America and Europe, Islam is viewed in the Caribbean as undergoing a process of conservative Islamization that women's dress makes visible. Second, I'll use some court cases and political events to argue that a regional increase in the wearing of hijab, niqab, and other Muslim female and male dress is framed as obstructing post-colonial creolization projects and confusing bodily markers of ethnicity and culture that are normalized by post-colonial Anglophone Caribbean nation states. First, some geography and history. I always like to start with a map. Guyana and Trinidad are two former British Caribbean colonies that are demographically almost evenly split between the descendants of African slaves and the descendants of Indian indentured laborers who were brought by the British to work on sugar plantations after the abolition of African slavery in the British West Indies beginning in the early 1830s. The main post-colonial state actors in conflict with each other have been Afro-Caribbean Christians pitted against Indo-Caribbean Hindus and Muslims which is not to say that all Indo-Caribbean people are Hindu or Muslim. Until the late 20th century, Islam was historically viewed in the Caribbean as an Indian religion as a result of the legacy of indentureship. But that is changing partly as a result of Afro-Caribbean conversion or reversion to Islam. Islam in the Caribbean began with two groups of Africans. First, colonial Moriscos and Moros, enslaved, enslaved post-Reconquista Moors from the Maghreb region, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, who accompanied Spanish and Portuguese voyages of exploration and conquest in the New World in the 16th century and after. These Moriscos left no continuous practicing Muslim presence in Latin America and the Caribbean, and neither did the second group of Muslims in the Americas that is enslaved Muslim West African victims of the transatlantic slave trade from Senegambia, Guinea, 
Ivory Coast, Mali, and present-day Nigeria. Historians estimate that at least 10% of Africans enslaved in the Americas may have been Muslim. Educated West African Muslim women, men, that is, distinguish themselves by their literacy in the Americas, but there are no texts that we know of written by enslaved African Muslim women. That is not that African Muslim women weren't educated, some very much were, but perhaps we can chalk it up to the doubled hardships of being an enslaved female-bodied person between the 16th and 19th centuries in the Americas. As my fellow panelists, who you, whom you'll hear from in a bit, Jocelyn Fenton Stitt points out, there is not a single narrative by a woman about the Middle Passage, the journey from the door of no return to the Americas. In the Caribbean, there are few slave narratives at all, and only one long form narrative by a non-Muslim woman, Mary Prince of Bermuda. The second chapter, or perhaps the third chapter in the Caribbean's Muslim history is that of Indian Muslim migrants indentured on Caribbean sugar plantations in the 19th and 20th centuries. Indian indentureship in the Caribbean lasted from 1838 to 1917. The first ships transporting Indian indentured laborers to the Caribbean, the Whitby and the Hesperus, which both reached British Guyana from Calcutta on May 5, 1838, carried 94 Muslim passengers, only three of whom were adult Muslim women out of a total of 424 Indian migrants. This extreme and continued gender disparity was later responsible for a lot of plantation and plantation domestic violence. Muslims constituted less than 14% of the half a million Indian arrivals to the Caribbean during indentureship. That percentage decreased to 6 to 10 percent after indentureship due to repatriation and conversion. Perhaps the most invisible instance of Islamic creolization in the Caribbean is the Shia Indo Caribbean legacy of the festival of Husay during the month of Muharram, commemorating the martyrdom of the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, grandsons Hussein and Hassan. Jose features processions of model tombs called tajas and drumming. The festival was almost stamped out by the British in the late 19th century in Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname because it encouraged mass gatherings of people of many races in the colony. But it has been preserved in Cedros and St. James in Trinidad, as you can see here. Johan de Cruyff identifies an are what he calls an Arab purification and Indo-Iranian neo-traditionalism as the two main opposing forces in Guyanese and Caribbean Islam today, arguing that there is a battle over culture, a clash between advocates of a deculturalized Arab Islam and those who, who, those who stress the importance of Indian traditions and ethno-religious brotherhood. Raymond Chikri similarly sees the divide as a generational culture clash between older people who are wedded to their ancestral Indian Islam and younger people who disparage this tradition as being influenced by Hinduism and who look instead to the Arab world for a quote unquote authentic Islam. Black Muslims tend to be excluded from these movements and narratives because they are generally reverts rather than hereditary Muslims, and because there is a long history of Indian and African racial conflict in Guyana and Trinidad that has nothing to do with religion. Beginning in the 1970s, Caribbean Muslims have also contended with worldwide revivalist Tajdeed and reformist Isla Islamic projects, as well as with a growing Islamization of local religious practices deemed cultural and bida innovation, uh, such movements are loosely termed, for example, in the Saudi and Egyptian context, the Islamic revival or awakening, as Sahwa al Islamiya, which Sabah Mahmoud identifies as including both the activities of state oriented political groups and the development of a piety oriented religious ethos or sensibility in majority Muslim countries. I argue in the book that the metropolitan focus of Caribbean Muslims is in the process of shifting from the Indian subcontinent and liturgical Urdu Islam to the Arab world and Arabic. 
This process began in the 1970s with the supplanting of Indian and Pakistani missionaries with, interestingly, diplomats from Muammar Gaddafi's non-aligned Libya, an outreach from the Libyan Islamic Call Society, a Dawa or proselytization organization. Nowadays, this is in the context of the Cold War and the non-aligned movement. Nowadays, young Caribbean Muslim men travel to Egypt, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE in the Arab Middle East for Islamic education rather than to where they used to go, the Indian subcontinent. And in 2015, other connections to the you know, transnational Muslim world include that there were a number of media sensationalized stories of Muslim Guyanese, Trinidadians, and Jamaicans traveling to Syria to fight for the Islamic State. In the Caribbean, Muslims threaten 20th century and 21st century's discourses of post-colonial belonging, which call for creolization and ethnic and cultural hybridity as conditions of citizenship. Debates and angst over Indian and Muslim creolization often, not surprisingly, happen on the battleground of women's dress and bodies. So here's a photo of some Muslim women in 1964 on the eve of Guyanese independence, which happened in 1966. This dress is normal for the time. The lightly draped Indian orni over the head modest but not ankle length dresses and not everyone is wearing trousers underneath their dresses and then of course you can tell when we are by the optional beehive hair. The indicator that it's a religious a quasi-religious context is that they're covering covering their heads although this is not a prayer context more of a social religious context if they were in a prayer context they were they would cover more and possibly wear the Indian shalwar kameez if they were praying in a mosque. Talwar kameez, that is the tunic and pants plus dupatta or orni, were what constituted Muslim dress for, for Indo-Caribbean women. The sari was viewed as Hindu garb. In the context of contemporary Islamic revivalism, in Caribbean Muslim spaces now, some Muslim women still wear Indian dress, but others wear Gulf Arab style clothes, as I'll show you. In the book, I relatedly talk about gendered pious performance with reference to Saba Mahmoud's work on the double performativity of gendered religiosity. What she calls Muslim theater may be performed by pious women through ritual prayer, that is salah or namaz, that requires specific dress and emotional and intentional affect. Despite their fashionable 60s attire here, Caribbean Muslim women have always been presumed regionally to be different, capable of marrying earlier and submitting to greater family, community, and patriarchal restrictions on their lives. For example, Trinidad's Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, until amended by a parliamentary act very recently in 2017, stipulated that Muslim boys could be married at the age of 16 and Muslim girls could be married at the age of 12, which was the youngest permissible age for anyone to be able to marry in Trinidad. Hindu girls were allowed to marry at 14, girls of other faiths at 16, and all other boys at 18. The rationale for that law that allowed Muslims and Muslim minors to be married much earlier than anyone else in Trinidad was that it was a nod to Muslim community practice and norms, and that Sharia, Islamic law, in its most conservative iteration, allows girls to marry at the age of nine. So this, this photo here is how Sunni Muslims in the Caribbean are most likely to dress now in a religious setting and perform their piety and, and Muslimness. This, this should look very familiar to you in the US too. Um, in, a, in, it's a, in a much more Arab style, the thobe for men, maybe the abaya for women, and a more standard looking hijab, in line with the post 1970s Arabization of Muslim dress across the Ummah, the Muslim world. As Saba Mahmoud, Lila Abu Lugod, Lila Ahmed, Fatima Mernissi, and other Muslim feminists have written, paternalistic non Muslim antipathy toward the hijab, veil, and burqa on behalf of Muslim women is a foundational part of discourse on Islam that serves to conceal neo colonial agendas. Leila Ahmed writes that from the 19th century on, calls for unveiling came already marked with notions of who was civilized and who was not, 
and already replete with the markings of colonizer and colonized, European and non-European. And you can see these debates playing out today still in places like France. The visibility of Caribbean women's Islamic dress has made them the scapegoats for national discomfort with the non creolized difference posed by Muslims. I'll offer one or two legal cases revolving around Muslim women's dress in Guyana and Trinidad. In June 2013, Guyana's major national newspaper, Stabrook News, reported a court case in which Hindu defense attorney Hukum Chand refused to cross-examine a Muslim female witness wearing a niqab, a full face veil, unless she first removed it. Hukum Chand said, quote, if she had taken off the hijab so that her face could be seen, that would be all right. I don't dislike Muslims. Some of my best friends are Muslims, and I usually get along well with them, a classic. The largest organization in Guyana of local Indian Muslims, that is the Sunni Central Islamic Organization of Guyana, the CIOG, condemned the attorney for his bias and his insult to the Muslim community. Whereupon Hukum Chan, the attorney, asserted that while wearing a hijab did not legally violate the court's mode of dress, that a hijab covering your face, I'm quoting him, a hijab covering your face so that only your eyes are seen are in violation of the court's norms as it conflicts with the principle of observing the Muslim, the, sorry, the witness's demeanor. The court here means the collection of the Georgetown Magistrates Court and its entire judicial apparatus, including judges, attorneys, and witnesses, all of whom are expected to abide by trial procedures that draw heavily still from colonial British common law. The appearance of this witness was so orientalized, so foreign and alien to the court and the state, that first her niqab face veil was incorrectly named in the court and in the newspaper as a hijab, the headscarf only covering. Though the niqabi was a Guyanese woman, she, would not, she did not have the proper, as the attorney put it, demeanor of one not sartorially in dress, not in missing facial expression, and not in the gendered behavior expected of women of Muslim women, which is compliance. Hukum Chan, the lawyer, however, could not specify if any law was indeed being broken. Her appearance simply felt wrong to him in a moral and legal way that violated the social contract of the Guyanese public sphere. Race, again, is linked to religion in Guyana. Because her race could not be determined, this Muslim woman disrupted national identity constructs that demanded all Muslims be identifiable as Indian. The covered Muslim woman's Guyanese racial positionality was insert, uncertain. Later on, Hukum Chan backed down and said that he could be friends again once he could be friends with Muslim again because it had been proven that indeed she was Indian and Indian racial solidarity has long been more important in the Caribbean than religious difference. One legal, I'll note another legal case that illustrates the Trinidadian antipathy to Muslim women's religious dress. In 1994, an, an 11 year old Muslim girl named Sumaya Muhammad was refused admission to a Catholic high school in Trinidad because she wore a hijab. Shortly after, the Catholic, Anglican, Presbyterian, Baptist, and Hindu boards of education released a joint statement prohibiting the wearing of the hijab to class in their state-supported schools. The girl's parents sued, claiming constitutional freedom of religion and the fact that the school accommodated Catholic nuns in full veil. After a year of legal wrangling, the judge ruled in favor of the child, but limited the ruling to that single instance. Sumaya was able to attend a Catholic school wearing her hijab, but all other Christian and Hindu-run schools were permitted to discriminate against other girls who wore the hijab. The Guyanese and Trinidadian hijab and niqab cases show that legislative and community actors were prepared to block Muslim women's and girls full participation in the nation state if they dressed in identifiably orthodox Muslim ways. Head and face coverings were viewed as antithetical to Caribbean citizenship, as an infringement of the social contract in an ostensibly Western society. The example of the Jamaat al-Muslimin in Trinidad, however, 
shows that Muslim women may choose to subvert the traditional polarities of racialized creolization in the Caribbean while creating their own version of sartorially creolized local Islam. Some brief background. On July 27, 1990, led by Imam Yassin Abu Bakr, 114 armed members of the Muslim organization, the Jamaat al Muslimin, seized control of sorry, seized control of the Trinidadian government and held Prime Minister A. N. R. Robinson hostage in an attempted coup that lasted six days before their surrender to the army and police. 31 people allegedly lost their lives as a direct or indirect result of the coup, while approximately 700 were wounded and arson, looting, and property damage were extensive. The organization remains as a rel relatively quiet community in a compound in Port of Spain. Until his death in October 2020, it was still led by coup leader Imam Abu Bakr, who remained a figure of menace in the Trinidadian imaginary until he passed away. I interviewed him for the book. The Muslimin framed themselves as both an Islamic and a Black nationalist organization in the tradition of Malcolm X, and most of their members were Afro-Caribbean and Afro-Trinidadian converts to Islam. In 1990, Abu Bakr practiced polygamy and had three wives who all claimed to be quite happy with their marriage arrangements. The Trinidadian public therefore concluded that Muslim women must be a breed apart. Nowadays, Muslim women, who number about 150, affect what Trinidadian anthropologist Jean Baptiste calls a pious sexuality, where piety and sexuality are not diametric diametrically opposed, but coterminous and extend beyond the borders of the bedroom. Most are in monogamous marriages, with polygamous marriages amongst the upper echelons of the Muslim social structure, that is, the older heads like the Imam and his closest advisors. Contemporary Muslim women divide with themselves by dress and politics into older and younger factions. It is the older, mostly Afro-Trinidadian women who witnessed the 1990 coup, who mostly continue to dress in, quote, monotone, plain, heavy cotton fabric in burqa, chador, or niqab, and gloves and stockings. But finally, unlike the older women, Younger Afro-Trinidadian Muslimin women, whether converts or born into Islam, have found a way to dress Muslim without covering up fully. In the search for a way to dress differently from the general Trinidadian public, as a marker of both religious adherence and pride, they have chosen to dress Indian. Such younger Afro-Trinidadian women came of age in 1990s and 2000s Trinidad, where post-colonial Creole society was more fully realized and racial divisions were perhaps somewhat less insurmountable. In the Muslimin Pampan Mosque, the younger women still dress modestly, but in what was traditionally considered Indian fashions, an elaborate and lightly textured sari material with brightly colored beaded sequined shalwar kameezes and color coordinated head scarves. Young women ranging from late teens to early 20s attend Friday prayers very ornately adorned, including wearing a noticeable amount of gold jewelry. Young Black Muslimin women in Trinidad wearing the traditionally Indian Muslim mosque dress of shalwar kameez, Indian fashions, is a discreetly Muslim take on ethnic creolization conflicts in Trinidad and the Caribbean. Contra other trends in Muslim dress in the Caribbean, where it is now common to see Black and Indian Muslim men attending mosques in Arab thobes, the young Muslimin women's clothing is one instance in which the trend is away from Arab dress and toward a more uh, toward a different local understanding of what Caribbean Islam means. The Muslim young women's dress shows that there are ways to achieve what is the ideal of post-colonial Caribbean politics, that is the unity of African and Indian descendants of colonial labor without flattening out religious difference. I'll end there, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Khan. I always learn something new when I'm hearing you speak or reading something you write, and I encounter it often, so I'm always surprised, but uh, always humbled that, to learn something new from you, and, and today was just the same. Next, we have Dr. Jocelyn Fenton-Stitt. 
Dr. Stitt is an interdisciplinary scholar trained in women's and critical race studies and is division chair of the social sciences and associate professor at St. Catherine University. She earned her BA in women's studies and English from Pomona College, her MLit in Caribbean cultural studies from the University of Edinburgh, and her PhD in women's studies and English from the University of Michigan. Before joining St. Kate, she was director of research development at the Institute for Research on Women and Gender at the University of Michigan, and before that, Associate Professor of Women's Studies at Minnesota State University. Her book, Dreams of Archives Unfolded, Absence in Caribbean Life Writing, is part of Rutgers University's Critical Caribbean Studies series. Dreams of Archives Unfolded is the first academic book on pan-Caribbean life writing and the recent use of the genre by Caribbean women to explore historical and archival absences, including the confluence of Cuban Jewishness, feminism, and formal practices used to write about historical absences. Welcome, Dr. Stitt. Thank you so much. That was a very kind uh, introduction. Okay, here we go. Are my slides showing? Okay, there we go. Thank you so much to the Global Islamic Studies Center and to Latin American and Caribbean Studies at the University of Michigan for sponsoring this panel, and especially to Professor Aliyah Khan for inviting me and to Hana for organizing the talk. Um, as a graduate student at Michigan um, many years ago now, um, Latin American and Caribbean Studies provide, gave me my first uh, research grant and provided funding for my um, very first trip to uh, archives in the Caribbean. And what I found there um, became the inspiration for this book. So thank you very much for having me. My talk today is called Memorializing Jewish Cuba and Ruth Bahar's An Island Called Home. One of the things that drew me to study in the Caribbean was the realization that almost everything that happened in the Americas after European contact began there. The waves of immigration of people from around the globe that uh, people in the United States learn is a hallmark of their country's history in the 19th and 20th, 20th centuries began in the 1500s in the Caribbean. While outsiders to the region may be most familiar with the cultures of Afro-Caribbean people through celebrations such as Carnival or music such as reggae, in fact, the Caribbean has long had immigrants from the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, as well as uh, involuntary immigrants um, in the form of indentured laborers from India and other parts of Asia. For example, the oldest surviving synagogue in the Western Hemisphere is in Curaçao, first established in 1674, with the current building constructed in 1730. You can see on um, one side of the slide uh, the synagogue and another side um, that it has a sand floor, which is um, um, uh, comes from um, uh, Jewish practices in Spain and Portugal, um, where um, steps were um, muffled by putting sand on the floor of a synagogue to um, hide um, their practices from the Spanish Inquisition. Thus, Jewish, Jew, Jewish history in the Caribbean is not a recent phenomenon, even as it is perhaps less widely known than Jewish histories of North America. Amidst ongoing debates about the relevance of the past to the present, known in Caribbean studies as the quarrel with history, and in African American studies as the question of recovery, I maintain that absence conceptually creates a generative space for Caribbean epistemologies. What interests me are life writing texts grappling with the absence of evidence from the past, especially as it relates to women's histories. The text treated in my book, Dreams of Archives Unfolded, Absence in Caribbean Life Writing, engage with a wide variety of archives, not just official records, and theorize about the power dynamics that produce the absences they find. As the first monograph on pan-Caribbean life writing, Dreams of Archives Unfolded focuses on how and why recent personal narratives from across the region share common um, motifs such as narratives and plotted by absence. Implotted by absence indicates life writings that structure their narratives around a deliberate facing off with the unknown and unknowable in family and national histories. 
The authors of these texts claim epistemic agency in writing history, even as historically women's first person narratives mark another site of archival absence in the Caribbean. The archive as a generative limit rather than the point of scholarship itself is one of the lessons of this body of contemporary Caribbean life writing. Today I'm going to be talking about the work of Cuban-American Ruth Bahar, a writer and anthropologist who's also a professor at the University of Michigan. Early in my project, Professor Bahar uh, granted me an interview to talk about her work, and I'm very grateful for, um, for that. Significantly for my project, Ruth Bahar pioneered the practice of combining academic analysis and life writing in the 1990s. Prefiguring the rise of auto-theoretical texts by several decades, Bahar's work enabled the development of autobiographical criticism or academic life writing, where scholars' personal investments and histories become part of the study. Bahar's deployment of historiography, ethnography, and personal narrative anticipates and perhaps even made possible the approaches, the approaches in many of the works I examined, such as in Sadia Hartman's Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Route. Bahar has been awarded a MacArthur Fellowship as well as, well as other accolades for her innovative formal approaches. While Bahar's corpus has been justly celebrated, I focus here on an island called Home, Returning to Jewish Cuba, published in 2007, and how it creates an alternative archive even as it troubles that category. Bahar writes from his position of exile and loss, but with a consciousness that the welcome given to Cuban Jews stands in contrast to hostile U.S. immigration policies for other Caribbean groups. Referencing Jose Marti's rejection of the new American empire, Bahar writes, I am Cubana because the border between our America and the America which is not ours is a real border guarded by guns and decorated with ink. Bahá repeatedly claims her Cuban identity and status as an insider, but it is her American passport and occupation as an anthropologist that allows her to travel to Cuba. Bahá's works acknowledge recent popular and scholarly interest in Cuban Jews and Jewish culture in the Caribbean, while arguing for the, con the continuing necessity to explain where she comes from and how Jewish and Cuban identities come to inhabit one body. Once in America, Bahar writes, they would forever have to explain that they were Cubans who also happened to be Jewish. For Bahar, Cuba represents a longed for home. Writing for a longing for Cuba that cannot be fulfilled places Bahar in the company of other Cuban American writers. Indeed, Cuban American literature is filled with similar moments such as in Christina Garcia's novel, Dreaming in Cuban, published in 1992, where a character muses, quote, Cuba is a particular exile, I think, an island colony. We can reach it by a 30-minute charter flight from Miami, yet never reach it at all. However, Ju Bahar's Jewishness creates a sense of ur urgency for a return related to the dwindling number of Cuban Jews. The world her parents knew in Havana in the 1950s is nearly gone. She estimates that there are about 30 Cuban people remaining whose parents are both Jewish and a larger community of Jewish people of between one to 2,000. The family archive comes to represent evidence of Bahar's family's life, but also memorial to the presence of Jews in Cuba generally. Bahar's family history tells the broader history of Jews in Cuba. Bahar's mother's family were Ashkenazi Jews who emigrated from Poland and Russia to Cuba in the 1920s. Her father's Ladino-speaking family left Turkey in the 1920s, settling into different Cuban neighborhoods and synagogues than the Ashkenazi Jews. Her parents' families were united by religion, but separated by language and class. Bahar notes that for her Yiddish-speaking Ashkenazi grandparents, quote, Spanish was the language of the Goyim, but for my paternal grandparents, it was precisely the language of their Jewishness, a thread that wound its way back to Ladino, the 15th century Spanish that Sephardim wrote with Jewish letters. While there have been Jews in Cuba since Europeans first arrived, Bahar's family story of immigration represents a swelling of their numbers in the 20th century, estimated to reach 15 to 20,000 before Castro gained power in 1959. The Bahar's family story of immigration is also typical. Almost all Cuban Jews left in the years after 1959, fearing that the Cuban government would confiscate religious properties as well as redistribute personal wealth. 
As a child immigrant, Bahar's first source of materials about Cuba is her family's photographs, as well as their oral histories, rather than her own memories. Quote, growing up in New York, I was grateful for the little archive of black and white photographs my parents and grandparents were able to salvage from the midst of our hurried departure. Looking at the photographs of my family in Cuba was how I saw Cuba again, the Cuba I wanted to remember. Labeling her family's collection of photographs as an archive, Bahar recognizes that they uniquely preserve memories of being Jewish in Cuba in a way official archives of the immigration of Cubans to the United States do not. The photographs testify that her family before leaving Cuba was full of hope in contrast to her family post-immigration when they became, quote, traumatized and scared. Two formal characteristics help Bahar create what I call an absence aesthetic for her counter archive. First, in an island called home, time is sped up, skips or slows as a mean of representing how archival absences and epistemological uncertainty influence how knowledge gets transmitted in the present. Second, images serve as evidence for their connection to the Caribbean of traumatic events and of the passage of time. The historicity of the Bahars family's emigration from Cuba and the transmission of this journey in the present through archival images bear a relationship to Marianne Hirsch's theory of post-memory. Post-memory describes how trauma is tra transmitted intergener intergenerationally in life writing, often through photography, so that descendants describe these experiences as their own memories. Not coincidentally, Bahar's work bears traces of post-memory, given that some of Hirsch's main examples come from children and grandchildren of those who survived the Holocaust. Bahar's family left Europe, quote, just in the nick of time. It was 1934, the eve of the Holocaust, when they set foot in the tropics, end of quote. But they lived in the shadow of how quickly a government could turn against them, a fear reactivated under Castro. Photographs of the Bahar family in Cuba provide evidence of their existence there, and for Bahar, they become a stand-in for her own memories. Cuba looms for Bahar as a place where some form of recuperation of the losses of history can happen, such as the multiple displacements her family experienced in the 20th century, which is a form of an archival dream. One of the key differences, however, between Bahar's experience of diaspora and those of the Indo or Afro-Caribbean diasporas is that aspects of her family's past are recoverable. Bahar's account of visiting her grandparents' hometown during her first visit to Cuba and being offered a list of names of her ancestors remembered by the townspeople contrasts with the absences found by other Caribbean writers who search their family's origins um, in Africa or in India. At the same time as Bihar experiences a sense of belonging in Cuba, it comes to stand in for her as the past, a past fraught with anxiety. Caribbean writing's relationship to history is one filled with affect, anxiety, repetition, and fear, which can manifest in a, last of, in a lack of narrative confidence. David Scott states, indeed, the Caribbean novel is almost by definition has been saturated with an obsessive quarrel with the past, one that makes of the past a pervasively recurrent question. It has been saturated with an anxious, anxious sense that the past, whatever it is, cannot be taken for granted. I read Bahar's confession of desire for her own memories, for her own history, both photo, um, photographic and textual, to be documented in Island Called Home through formal choices that reflect a Caribbean relationship to the vexed nature of history. Structurally, the opening and concluding sections rehearse Bahar's family history, but are accompanied by family photographs, current images of places resonant to her family, such as the Patronato Synagogue in Havana, and images of materials that might be found in a museum or archive of Jewish Cuban life, such as others' passports or tombstones. Periodization and thus time becomes blurred as uncaptioned photographs and documents from 1945 are juxtaposed with images from the 1960s to the present, suggesting the present's continuity with the past. The book creates a memorial as it documents through ethnography and visual evidence what Jewish immigrants brought to the island, such as the uniform one of them wore in a Nazi concentration camp. Um, that's the larger picture on this side, on this slide. By attempting to unite anthropology and photography, Bahar hoped to avoid exoticizing Cuban Jews through a tourist gaze. However, the uneven pedantic tone and the presence of explanatory passages for some photographs but not others reveal the multiplicity of the text's intended audience. 
Depending on their positionality, most readers will move through varying levels of knowledge about Judaism, European and Caribbean history, and U.S. foreign policy. Although Bahar finds success in working with the Jewish community in Cuba to create an alternative archive of those still living there and a, and a memorial to those who left, her, her authority as a woman to write and determine a larger narrative does not extend to her family. Family autobiographers depend on family narratives for their writing, with or without approval. Bahar describes the aftermath of, pu of publishing an essay on encouraging her grandmother, Baba, to take possession of her father Abraham's handwritten autobi autobiography about Jewish life in Poland before emigrating to Cuba in the 1930s. The book, as Bahar's family calls it, was long in the possession of Abraham's oldest and wealthiest son. When this son asks for the book to be returned, Bahar encourages her grandmother to resist the male prerogative of ownership. Quote, just as Jacob stole Esau's birthright with the complicity of his mother, my Baba stole the book from her brother to pass on to me. I am glad we were such good thieves. To want to be a scholar and a writer was not easy in my family. In Baba's possession, Abraham's words undergo an alchemy of translation. The Yiddish text is read aloud by Baba, who translates it into Spanish, so Bahar could then put those words back into writing. Bahar authorizes herself as a scholar and is the rightful possessor of an important heirloom, quote, soon after my grandmother died, I rushed it home like a looted treasure. I buried it in my fireproof cabinet, where I also keep old family pictures and other memorabilia from Cuba. The book joins the archive of family photographs that served as a catalyst for Bahar's life writing in an island called, called home, with Bahar as chief archivist. Such Good Thieves, as the article is titled when it was published in the Jewish women's magazine Hasada, infuriated Bahar's family since it portrayed Baba as complicit in Bahar's desire to own the book. No doubt the, the exposure of this family secret in a magazine read by the Jewish community played, by, played a part in her family's reaction. Bahar's uncle, in particular, challenges her right to own the original handwritten copy saying that perhaps the book was meant to be passed down to his father, who is Abraham's son, and not to Ruth's grandmother. Ruth's uncle calls into question Bahar's legitimacy as a scholar, threatening to report Bahar to her university, quote, you're the kind of scholar who do anything to get the documents you want, aren't you, unquote. Her uncle hurls gendered insults, accusing Ruth of being self-serving and careerist, insistent on telling her own story rather than deferential to older male relatives and bowing to the wishes of her family. Still, even as Ruth cries tears of shame, she refuses to give her uncle the manuscript. She remains the keeper of the family history, the one who will choose how to memorialize their past. Bahar claims the right to own her family's archival materials and to control the family history released to, to the public. I'm gonna end there, um, but thank you very much um, for this invitation. And if you're interested in learning more about um, Caribbean autobiography, um, you can find my Instagram account, um, Caribbean Autobiography. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stitt. I can't wait to check out your Instagram after this and having read your work, I'm looking forward to it very much. Now, as we transition to our time of discussion and q and I've been asked to tie these works together in some way and begin to put them into conversation for us. And how, you might be asking, can one put these three topically expansive, if compellingly varied, works into conversation? Well, that's been my task over the preceding weeks as I read and reread each. First, you have Dr. Cavacuros' work, which sets out to answer two interrelated questions. How does faith migrate? And how does migration transform devotional practices and religious meanings? And he answers these questions by telling stories of saints, contemporary miracles, and what he calls manifestations of the deeply human search for meaning and connection in a world that often seems intent on destroying both. Then you have Dr. Khan's uh, analysis of the continuous Afro and Indo-Muslim presence and cultural influence in the Caribbean where she claims that they are not different or separate from other Caribbean people in their negotiation of culture and place. And thus she situates Islam and Muslims firmly within the history and society of the Anglophone Caribbean by weaving together literary analysis of fiction, autobiography, poetry, nonfiction, and music and sartorial practices in Guyana, Trinidad, and Jamaica, 
with interviews, media analysis, and personal connections to key events. Finally, I have Dr. Stitt's Dreams of Archives Unfolded, which asks what happens when we reach the limits of the archives of colonialism, slavery, indenture, independence, and diaspora in the Caribbean, highlighting the gendered nature of colonial archive practices, post-colonial masculinist nationalism, and how contemporary women's life writing creates alternative ways of understanding the relationship between the past and the present. How indeed can these wide ranging works speak to one another? In some ways, they can't. They stand on their own, speaking to, of, and from particular people, places, and contexts that deserve the textured detail and nuanced analysis that each author gives them in their work. In other ways, however, they must speak to each other, given the ongoing urgency of their topics and their import to such people, places, and contexts. Each work is exemplary in many ways, as the authors tell stories untold and, more disruptively, untell stories long told from the perspective of the perceived center, from those in positions of power or those considered normative, and retell them in new and promisingly troublesome ways. This, I suggest, is their unified strength, that each, though dealing with disparate narratives, religious traditions, places, personages, and peoples, centers that which has been marginalized in order to disrupt the just-so stories we've come to assume about colonially defined geographies and peoples like the Caribbean, Latin America, and or global Islam. As someone who transgresses into each of these territories in my own research and writing, I believe, therefore, that these works exemplify the kind of scholarship I want to encounter and need to encounter, for that matter insofar as they interfere with my own assumptions, disturb my own schema, and introduce to me new voices, histories, and lineages long silenced, forgotten, or otherwise missed by my white, male, and Protestant Christian gaze. I found myself disrupted, disturbed, or otherwise confronted with gaps in my knowledge, persons just outside my peripheral vision, or things I'd overlooked that they were staring me in the face in many ways. For example, when I learned through Dr. Khan's work that Trinidadian writer Brendan Flanagan, Brenda Flanagan, excuse me, author of Alan Islands, was the younger sister of Imam Yassin Abu Bakr, leader of the St. James Port of Spain based organization Jamaat al Muslimin, the group, as Dr. Khan mentioned, that carried out a failed coup d'etat in July 1990. This was an event I'd encountered numerous times before and written about both in a journal article and a chapter of my monograph, and yet I learned something new, something I missed in my own research through Dr. Khan's work. Such an interventional insight occurred yet again when reading Dr. Stitt's final chapter as she analyzed um, Irene Villar's The Ladies' Gallery, a memoir of family secrets, which she didn't get to talk about this evening. Villar writes about her infamous grandmother, Lolita Lebron, a Puerto Rican nationalist who was convicted of attempted murder and other crimes after carrying out an armed attack on the US Capitol in 1954. While reading the New York Times bestselling book, Olga Dies Dreaming by Sochio Gonzalez this summer, I neglected to note the parallels between Lolita Lebron and the protagonist's mother in that book, Blanca, a young Lord radical who left her children to be raised by family while she advanced Puerto Rico's nationalist cause. Despite Gonzalez's explicit invocation of Lebron alongside other symbols of Puerto Rican pride, like the coqui frog, the black and white independence flag, and rapper Big Pun. Or more recently, I was confronted when I was in Tijuana conducting some preliminary field work at a migrant shelter for Muslims in its Zona Norte neighborhood, nearby the grave of vernacular saint Juan Soldado, which Dr. Cabo Quiroz mentioned and which I visited. But as Dr. Cabo Cabo Coros is right to point out, Olga Camacho is often erased from Juan Soldado's hagiography. While people see their own precarious status and find hope in Juan Soldado, his sacrification includes the erasure of Santa Luita through a process Dr. Cabo Quiroz calls the dark alchemy of misogyny, wherein various matrices of power converge to present a distorted male-centered narrative that colludes in the same violence it recounts. Given violence against women in the borderlands, there is now a movement to recognize, resurrect, and sanctify Olga Camacho as Santa Aurita, a point the author brings quite powerfully home in his book as he recounts cutting the grass at Olga's grave in Colonia Castillo, just 10 minutes walk away from the grave of Juan Soldado, which I visited in September. However, I did not visit Olga's grave. With this neglect, 
I once again erased her story and exacerbated, if subtly, the misogynistic violence of the US-Mexico border. I was confronted and convicted just two weeks later as I read in Dr. Calva Quiroz's work how Juan's and Olga's entangled yet disparate histories illustrate the complexities and violence in the region that are created by poverty and the precarious disparities of power and the ways communities summarize, decipher, and unfortunately also reproduce its dramatic and violent atrocities. In addition to how they bring to light that which is hidden and provide interventions through new perspectives, there are also a few other themes I think they each touch on and through which they could be put into further conversation. First, the notion of what had been called, drawing on the work of Gloria Antalua and Anat Singh, among others, generative frictions, those productive borderlands where the tensions between two seeming opposites, objects, orders, places, produced new realities and created, if contested, adaptations or fresh fusions. In Calvo Kuros's work, we find these generative frictions between the officialdom of certain saints and the unsanctioned yet sanctified rituals, beliefs, and material words surrounding unofficial vernacular ones. In Far From Mecca, something similar occurs between the perceived centers of global Islam. Those representative sites like Mecca or Medina seem to be the navel and centrifugal nodes of the so-called Muslim world and supposedly peripheral locales like Trinidad, Jamaica, and Guyana, which Dr. Khan positions as equally important confluences of intertextual and embodied flows of the broader and more inclusive Islamic world. Finally, in Dr. Stint's work, between history and myth, between the archive and ancestral memory, between things recorded and things not quite remembered, but retold and unfolded, we are invited to unknow and relearn what it means to be, for example, a part of the Cuban Jewish diaspora through Ruth Behar's work. Another linkage between these three works is violence, colonial violence, archival violence, a topography of violence, and even violent events in the author's own biography, as when Dr. Khan describes her family's direct experiences of the 1983 Ahmadiyya gathering bombing in Trinidad and 1985 assassination of an Ahmadiyya Muslim missionary in Freeport. While each deals with violence, and so they must, given that their stories are set within a nexus of multiple competing colonial and neo-colonial political and social orders, these acts or steady states of violence are reinterpreted as sites of resistance and community organizing where power is questioned and constantly negotiated. As Dr. Calvos Quiroz puts it, within the context of the extreme violence of the physical, geographic, and political, religiosity in particular becomes an essential mechanism for holding together a world that seems to be falling apart. Religion, a scholarly category with which I am often obsessed, becomes a means of navigating and simultaneously a manifestation of the wounds or the lesions left behind by the violence of borders, or in this case, archives and embodied realities of violence within one's own family as well. Finally, and perhaps on a more hopeful note, these books each take seriously the analytic and aesthetic value of art, whether it be poetry, fiction, music, or visual arts. Dr. Stitt highlights numerous works of literature that cross boundaries and defy carefully constructed categories to enliven and inspire, even as they deal with difficult themes and wrestle with forgotten pasts. She also ends her book with a coda's worth of commentary on how the work of Firlai Baez, which also graces the book's cover, encapsulates her book's themes. For her part, Dr. Khan amasses a menagerie of poetry, fiction, clothing, and music, including calypso songs, women's sartorial expressions, and popular and renowned Guyanese poet and actor Muhammad Abdurrahman Slade, who reappropriated Sufi tradition in his literary works to make her case. Dr. Kava Kuroses highlights multiple artist works throughout his book, ending each chapter with a reflection on how art makes the power and polemic of vernacular saints visible, living, and embodied. A particular note is Edgar Clemente's art on the book's cover, which powerfully represents each saint he examines and which are used to visually interrupt the reader and set the scene as they flip from chapter to chapter. In conclusion, vernacular saints, Muslims in and of the Caribbean and women's literary autobiographies and the representation in these stories, these archives, these books are themselves works of artistic creation, as it puts it, creating new histories for others to learn from, lean into and live within. I am thankful to have encountered these works of academic inventiveness and to have walked away with more capacity to imagine and reimagine how Caribbean and Latin American lives are theorized and told. To that end, I thank the University of Michigan Islamic Studies Center, its Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, and Dr. Khan for the invitation to moderate and respond today. Thanks also to Rutgers University Press and Oxford University Press for their external sponsorship 
of this event and Hannah Matar's labor in administering this event. It's been a real joy and a welcome challenge. Now I'd like to open it up for some questions and I see that we have started to populate our list here. One that came up earlier in the evening is for Dr. Khan. I invite all of our speakers to, to turn on their cameras. We'll have a little bit of a conversation here. Uh, but the first question is for Dr. Khan. When did Muslim dress for Indo-Caribbean women change? We had this great visualization of hairdos and particular sortorial practices in the past, but when exactly did that shift occur? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you for that question. Um, so I would say it started sometime around the early 1990s, um, or at least like that's when I remember it happening. Uh, I was a child at that point attending a Muslim madrasa school, Islamic school in Georgetown in Guyana. And I remember at that point, you know, around like 1991 or so, um, <clears throat> young men, young guys coming back from places like Egypt and coming into the mosques and the Islamic schools and telling the teachers that they're doing Islam wrong. Um, and that they are not, and then telling women things like they're not dressed Islamically and so forth, even though, you know, like, they're definitely covering their heads and fully modestly covered and so forth. Um, but the style of it was wrong, mm. um, wrong. And the style of it was too Indian um, and not, and, and, you know, in, in a, in a, in a, um, it, it, when, when like uh, <clears throat> Muslim is equated with like looking more Arab. So yeah, I'd say around the early 1990s or so, but it really accelerated in probably the early 2000s with like really increased um, Dawa proselytization by Saudi Arabia and by the UAE that became involved a little bit later on than Libya and Egypt in, in proselytization in that part of the world. And when I say proselytization, I don't just mean like handing them money, um, but I mean like really becoming involved locally, like assisting in like mosque building efforts, like mm -hmm. sending people to talk, like sending their versions of the Quran, you know, their translations, their English translations of the Quran, lots and lots of different things. Um, that are in some cases are reciprocal and not just about like men going going there and coming back with like different ideas so yeah i'd say early 1990s is when it started but you know like early 2000s is when you would see in mosques um all the muslim women almost without exception wearing like what we think of as hijab in you know us in the in the united states you know, with like both an inner piece and an outer piece and no and no hair showing at all. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing up these also not explicitly religious contexts, right? That it could be in terms of business or in terms of activism or in terms of technological interface that this these influences are happening as, as well, right? Uh, going beyond the explicitly like religious interventions. It's really fantastic. Um, another question uh, that I had along the way, actually, um, was in your work, uh, Dr. Cavaqueros, you mention and, and talk about um, the ways in which spirituality and religion are at work and how you also work them into your uh, writing and into your research. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of conversation and sometimes contentious debate around these terms as well. And so how do you see them as distinct and different? Is it in the things that they do? Is, is that how you see them being different? And, and how might you, you be able to speak to the terminological uh, tumult that sometimes happens around these words? You know, I, I agree with you. And I think that's why that I say at one point, the thing became almost obsolete because they built in this kind of premises of uh, define borders about what is religious and what is secular, you know, what is political and who is the church and what is the state. But in my work, um, those boundaries are not ever clear cut. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, even with, when we think about La Santa Muerte, La Santa Muerte, when you see that image, you think, oh, is this. But you walk into Target and you see a similar image and you think, oh, is this one, but it's not the same. <laughs> So at what moment the person is able to consciously make the distinction between in the same image or the same icon to say, this is the same, and this is just an image that refers to ancestors or just the notion of death. 
Um, and that's part of what it makes, for example, La Santa Merced so complicated because the boundaries are not always clear. So the church may say this and this. However, the Catholic church have the other muertos or, you know, or holiday or the day for the saints that we celebrate the, the ancestors. So what I mean, and so for example, with the Santa Muerte, what the difference is not as much the icon itself, but the intentionality of the function that we give to the image. So if I have a little sculpture of La Catrina, you know, the, of death, uh, just this kind of a metaphor of death or the way to make fun of death or criticize class, as has happened, you know. Uh, but if I ask the image for a miracle, you know, and I, and, and, the, and I believe that the same will create that one, it changed the dynamics. So what it make complicated with the Santa Muerte is that people may have references to death, but this transformation that I can ask for intervention in my everyday life, make a miracle, is what differentiates La Santa Muerte from other um, ele elements that represent, that have the same form. So what I say is that even though thinking about religion, it makes me comfortable because I think, okay, when I walk in that space, I know what is happening. But when I go to an event on, on the Santa Muerte, it is very political. Or oh, 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 Toribio Romo, the fact that the people decide to do a parade and the, and the way of the parades go through neighbors who they knew who have attacking them previously. It is an act of political presence. I, I'm here, you know? Um, so in the way that they're not always clear, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't give an answer because I think this is also part of the thing. Now, the notion, for example, that the United States is trying to regulate religious practices. You know, where the person is formed. How do we define religious visas for, for people to come? Priests or, or imams or everything. The notion that the United States prefer if the person is from the United States because then assume the person has more alliance with the state. You know, so it made, me, it made me think that it's not a simple cut. Now, these discussions about religion and the state are not new, at least not in the United States. I mean, from the beginning, we, we abide to the, myth, to the myth that the pilgrims escape religious persecution, you know? So the state itself is based on that kind of premise. So we continue knowing this kind of thing. Uh, so I always think that a good way to understand how to navigate, at least in my research, is to let the people guide you. Mm -hmm. So it is the altar only a religious place, or it's a space of memory. So what I found is that many religious spaces construct the state itself, okay? Uh, the hierarchies in the altar or who decide that the Virgin of Guadalupe is at the center and these other images on the side. Uh, so it, 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 it reflects many of those kind of narratives that we have about gender or the states, who is a good citizen or who is a good Christian, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what is very interesting I give you an example, the region of Guadalupe. Uh, you can say, well, there is nothing more Catholic than the region of Guadalupe. Okay. But however, Chicanos had taken that image and I completely, you know, at one point, feminists say the region was trapped uh, in the altar and we need to liberate her. So from the 1960s until now, many artists have been engaged consistently in liberating the region of Guadalupe, including liberated not just as a woman, but also whatever constraint or gender may create it. So now we have Virgin Guadalupe who is a male or a transgender individual, or the Virgin half our, uh, is, you know, Alma Lopez work, the Virgin Guadalupe is married with a sirena, a mermaid, and have a, an affair, a queer affair. So, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that suddenly the Virgin Guadalupe remain, you know, at the Semiori Levy as a religious component, but now we have embedded with all these other meanings. You know, I mean, we can study the history at least in many uh, countries in, in Latin America, but the moment of the appearance of a virgin or the conversion, you know, uh, as the moment used to define the construction of the state. Yeah. Um, so just to say that the boundaries of what is secular or what is religious or what is the state or what is not, 
they just, for me particularly, just do not work. And the work that we do is actually uh, suturing, <laughs> you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and creating um, 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 a different la geography and landscape of what religiosity means. Yeah. I appreciate as you speak of the definitions coming from the work itself, from your interlocutors and their experiences, and also with a deep awareness of how the, the politics uh, of, of a society define what is spiritual, define what is religious, and can sometimes be repeated in academic works, but with yours, it goes back to the practices themselves and how they're contesting those politics. It's fantastic. Even, for example, I thought that I was so free. You know, I say, oh, you know, I know very well, but suddenly I will find out that I was, at the beginning, I was doing my research only understanding migration as from Mexico to United States. Mm. And as the world evolved, I figured out, wait, wait, I'm missing that now we have all these other elements of how the United States influenced religious practice in Mexico by rem reminiscences and the money that people send. And they decide, I'm going to do this on the other one. Or what is the job of people who have been deported in perpetrating particular religious practice after they had lived in the United States. So that changed completely. I mean, Toribio Romo, we will not understand Toribio Romo as a Catholic symbol if violence or migration created for the United States didn't, didn't happen in the first place. So he exists because of this kind of thing. Yeah. Next question for us to consider is, is one for all of us to look at, but I'm going to put you on the spot, Dr. Stitt, and ask you to go for it first. Um, is there a way that Jewish, Catholic, and Islamic dress are all connected in the Caribbean? And I'll, I'll pose that to you first, Dr. Stitt, but then also we can all kind of jump in on, on this one. This is from uh, one of our attendees. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and you know, one of the things that uh, Dr. Khan's um, presentation made me think about is um, a kind of um, a sort of um, kind of very foundational concept in post-colonial feminist studies around issues of um, dress and, for instance, um, like Western feminist ideal is that veiling or wearing a hijab is oppressive um, versus the um, you know, more theoretical interpretation that um, that wearing a hijab or other forms of religious dress can be a form of um, resistance to colonization, right? And so um, what that made me think about is the ways in which um, the, the form that takes in, in Cuba in the past couple of decades, um, and also uh, what, what Dr. Kama was saying about creolization, that the ideal in, in Cuba was to not have formal religion and to kind of create um, a creolized um, post-colonial society. And so for um, Jewish people there to, um, to worship or to you know, wear um, various uh, Jewish items of clothing is a resistance not to colonialism, but to um, Castro's regime. Um, so I think that's the way I would enter into that question. Um, and also in, in an interesting way, um, some of what Bahar talks about in terms of creating an archive um, finding documents of like marriage certificates or prayer shawls or other things are ways in which Jewish people in Cuba can um, authenticate themselves as Jews and then uh, receive um, um, visas and um, travel um, authorizations to go to Israel. So that's a kind of twist on the idea, I think, of um, religious observance as um, as um, oppositional to um, colonialism and in the, the case of present day Cuba, more in opposition to um, the regime in power there. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would just say um, <clears throat> just really, really quickly that dress is a way in which people, um, you know, oftentimes people perform their religiosity and it's how they perform their piety. Uh, and that goes for not just Muslims, although, you know, Muslims always seem to be at the forefront of that particular discussion um, in North America and in Europe, but it's everywhere, you know, if you're thinking about Catholicism, like debates over should you, should Muslim, should, should Catholic women wear the mantilla? Um, 
Freudian slip? <laughs> Are they all the same? Maybe. Um, should Catholic women wear, wear a mantilla in church? Um, you know, especially if, you know, William and I were talking about recently the resurgence of the Latin mass in, in the United States. Um, the, the New York Times just covered it too. Um, and, you know, all the pictures that I've seen where people have started going back to the Latin mass, the women are wearing mantillas. So that's part of it too. It's not just the mass itself, you know, it's about performing religiosity, performing piety for Jewish women, you know, um, there it's, it's the same thing. Like um, whether you wear a shaitel, the wig or the tichel, the, um, the, the head, the headscarf tells you something about wh what your positionality, your sectarian positionality is um, in, in, in Judaism, you know, are you Orthodox? Are you, are you, are you Hasidic, you know, um, and, and so on. So, yeah, I mean, just in general, I would say that, yes, it works like that for all of, all of, all of the above. Um, I guess those are the Judeo-Christian religions, although I really don't like that term. Um, you know, we are talking about the three there, I mean, in the sense that it excludes Islam, but then I know, I don't know what the alternative is. Some people use Abrahamic, but that has its own, like, political valences, too. No, I, I agree. I mean, <sighs> What to say, you know, because the Catholic Church is such a complicated institution. We know we say that Catholic Church, but it's really a, a corporation with many different branches in different places. So the Catholic Church uh, in Africa is different to the one in Latin America. But even there, the way that the Catholic live in Argentina is not the way that they live in, in Peru or in Costa Rica. Uh, I just give you, for example, that Latin American context. I mean, you can understand Latin American Catholic context. You don't understand poverty or inequality and the, and the and United States and European control. I mean, during John Paul II, he cannot, I mean, John Paul II was a reduced religious leader, but he was a politician. He canonized more saints during his period than all the Catholic Church before, in all the centuries before because he understood the saints work as a kind of a emotional anchor for people. But, but it didn't end here, there. For example, today, the Catholic Church very much is divided between John Paul II as a image of conservatism in terms of sexuality, and Francis as a, as, as a, uh, a too liberal. I mean, that United States Church is dividing those saints. My mom in Phoenix, the same community, the same, the same place when I started my research, the same parish, it went to have a majority Spanish masses to now have a majority Latin masses when people don't understand what's happening. So I'd say to people, you can understand those conservative, liberal, whatever, it, it, those terms are not even accurate, but you can understand those tensions what is happening in the church. If you go to one of those services, I mean, Martin Luther can say, service on Sunday is the place where we are more segregated because it, it, it really with the most of those anxieties about what does that mean to be safe, you know, and how the thing is linked with performance of gender or performing of class or performing of race, you know? So um, I feel like uh, that's something, uh, you know, I recently did research on masks that people were using during uh, COVID. And it was so interesting for me to see how uh, suddenly all this narrative of, of, of being saved by Jesus became synonymous and the end of the world, you know, of the apocalypse, were representing in the mass the people. So people cannot talk to each other, but they will have the image of St. Gabriel, you know. Uh, so the mass became, and, and, and here I'm not even talking about the resistance of many religious groups based on, re on religion or, 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 the, or, or the vaccine mandate, you know? And, it, and, it's not, and it's very interesting for me because it's a reinterpretation of freedom. It's not freedom to care for others, like a, I put in a, a vaccine to protect other people, but it's the freedom that is related only to myself. So, and they were using the mass as signifiers to make people know this is my politics and those things are not, I mean, COVID is, was a good example of how religion um, and sanitary ruling were so ambiguous for so many people based just on, on faith. Yeah, yeah. 
And it, it, as you bring up these, these masks that people are, are wearing as well, there's a question here, uh, again, about clothing. We were just talking about this, but this one is specifically in regards to Dr. Khan. You mentioned um, about Indo-Caribbean Muslims using symbols and, and dress and facial hair to mimic Arabness. And the question is, would it be accurate to say that piety for some Indo-Caribbean Muslims is tied to this sort of attempt to conflate Islam with racialized Arabness, almost as if Arabizing oneself through dress or behavior can create a more pious Muslim. Is that an accurate representation of, of what you were trying to say? Does that reflect your research? Yes, um, I, sim I you know, agree wholesale. <laughs> um, I see that question is from Sajid, who I think is in Trinidad right now. So thanks for um, tuning in from Trinidad. Uh, yes, I think, you know, especially for people who revert, um, and you know there are things we can talk about about why Muslims a lot of Muslims prefer the term revert to convert, but um, there especially for reverts, you know that is one of the first ways in which people can sort of symbolize both for themselves and the community around them that they are Muslim, um, and it tells people to how to some extent how Muslim you are or how Muslim you aspire to be, rather mm -hmm. um, depending on your. Um, your degree of, especially for women, like your degree of coverage um, and your degree of modesty. So yes, certainly um, we are, you know, we, in, in, the, in the context of the Ummah, the worldwide Muslim community, um, you know, we don't want to say that one group is, you know, one re regional group or particular ethnic group, you know, is privileged over the other, but, you know, orientation has always been to the Middle East. Um, for um, theological reasons, geographic, for historical reasons, and so forth, and, you know, toward privileging um, Middle Eastern Arab, you know, forms of intersection of religion and culture, and sometimes performing what is actually Arab culture and, uh, and, and Middle Eastern culture, rather than Islamic religion, is yeah. also a symbol that you have become Muslim. So, yeah. Thank you very much. We're coming up on the, the hour mark here, but we've got a few more questions and I just got permission from Hannah to go a little over if people are willing to hang as, as well. Um, but uh, one question here takes the conversation in a bit of a different direction, uh, away from clothing uh, and sartorial practices, which I think are very important, uh, to ask about social media and information technology. This is from uh, Anna and she asks, um, do social media and IT affect the way various religious groups in the Caribbean gain visibility and express themselves? And again, open this up to, to each of you and, and you're welcome to, to jump in and chime in as you'd like. That, I would say, if that's okay, uh, that was one of the biggest surprises that I have when I started doing my research. Uh, I, I found out that as, ta as some of those saints evolve over time, uh, when I, by the time that I get to my last chapter on La Santa Muerte, that digital was very central, very mm. central to the construction, to the dissemination, to the process of learning, to the, I mean, because coming from a, from a kind of Catholic background, I thought, wait, you probably have a place to form the people and you learn how to do the service. And they were like, no, no, uh, we got all together online and we performed that ritual there and we had the service online. And, said, and they start talking about, there were groups. I mean, look at how amazing. In Mexico, uh, there is restriction of course about the distinction between the state and religion. So, but one of these groups wanna have get funding from the state to do charity work. So they define themselves as a no-profit organization who do charity work. They did all the process, just went to YouTube, and look at videos of how to do all the forms and the language and everything. And it was through online that they were able to get the permission. And this is before COVID. Yeah. Now, now, for many of these people, for example, the service that happened to La Santa Muerte in, in um, what is called, in Queens, remember, we have little, we have communities were very, very small, one person, three people, four, a family in middle Iowa. They cannot go to the service in a big city. So that the online became the space to connect and to do the spiritual religion to the point that uh, my next book is about the digital. I mean, I say God in the cloud because these people are, I mean, the way, the way that the internet is transforming, 
everyone, <laughs> including uh, traditional, you know, mainstream. The Catholic ch Catholic Church was the last one uh, in embark in doing services online during COVID, but it had to do at the core of the definition of the rituals, because a different of the Reformed churches, uh, they are very much tied to the body and to being present, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. So people need to go and drink it and eat it. The confession is not valid if you do it by phone. So the Catholic Church completely here in the United States refused for a long time to embark in the religion uh, mm -hmm. via online. And they were the first one who left. However, the study has showed that evangelicals were way better prepared because they understood that it was about the experience. So you may change to a digital format, but the need for the spiritual experience remain here. While Catholics were just doing a performance and some people were just watching, if you connect or not, that emotionally, that's it had nothing to do. So for me, uh, it really changing the landscape of how people, the, the, young, the young people are not going to church anymore, but yeah. they're not letting go to the need for the spiritual. So they find it in other places. In the, and, and the chat room, uh, there is a very interesting book, old, Virtual Faith, that is talk about how the Generation X, imagine, that's how old it is who talk about how they reconnect to the spiritual uh, just to, they, they didn't even have the internet as well connected as the new generation. So for me, yes, because it's also allowed for this cross border uh, colonization mm -hmm. and learning uh, of the religious experience beyond that national state who as a project is already decay because it's not working. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Ken, in thinking about um, these kind of transnational connections, I actually was wondering if you could tell us more about um, the research that you just did on um, the the center in Tijuana that's processing um, Muslim migrants. Like, wow, like when you mentioned, when you first um, mentioned this to me, like uh, when it was a week or two ago, I had no idea. Like, I was just completely blown away that like there is a center that processes Muslim migrants from where, like Latin America, Central America, and so on. That there would be enough of a call for this, um, so that there would be there would be such a, a center that even exists. I mean, that is telling us something very important about what is happening with um, religion and Islam in Latin America. So, would you mind telling us a little more about like what's going on there? Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you for for asking me a question. Uh, of mm -hmm. all things, but um, yeah, this first came to my attention when a group called the Latino Muslim Foundation in the San Diego area, uh, which I was familiar with as a, as a Latinx and specifically Latina, it's all women-led um, philanthrop philanthropic group and activist group in San Diego, they were raising funds for this shelter uh, and were able to, to raise uh, about a half million uh, to be able to purchase property, develop it, etc., and they had some big names like Omar Suleiman, uh, some kind of you know celebrity imams and sheikhs and things like that in the U.S. to be able to do so, and uh, they opened that shelter in March and April of this year, and they've already processed close to 800 migrants to the shelter, predominantly Muslim, not all of them Muslim, but really? mostly Muslim, yeah. um, and most of them are asylum seekers. Uh, and so they help them prepare for that, get them testing uh, every single day so that they're ready to go over the border. Uh, they're working with uh, psychologists without borders, um, doctors without borders, et cetera, who are doing local organizational work as well um, and helping them process trauma, helping them get ready for the asylum process and the trauma of that um, and the questioning at the border. There's you know, been some reports uh, from the ACLU, et cetera, that Muslims face more intensive uh, interrogation uh, at the border, uh, where whatever border and processing facility they come through, et cetera. Um, but what was really fascinating to me is a couple of things that I, I've been focusing on now in my very early work on this is, uh, first, the trajectories of these Muslim migrants are, are multiple and varied. So you have people coming from Chechnya, who are fleeing conscription in the war uh, against Ukraine. You have economic migrants coming from Ghana and Mali. Uh, you have um, migrants coming from, uh, refugees coming from Afghanistan um, as part of uh, you know, the US's 
uh, withdrawal and the, the after effect of that and the, the asylum opportunities that are available to them uh, because of that withdrawal. You still have some people coming from Syria. Um, and then you have people coming from you know, Yemen, Eritrea, uh, and, and elsewhere. Um, and often coming from conflict or disruption or economic need. Uh, but all of them have different narratives and all of them find this node at the shelter, uh, just a block away from La Linea. Uh, and so it's, it's an interesting kind of connecting point. And some of the interviews I did are talking about the, the encounters between these migrants at this shelter, who otherwise would not encounter one another's narratives so readily or so easily. Um, and the other aspect of this is there's long been discourse about Muslims at American borders, hemispheric American borders, but then particularly at the US-Mexico border. It seems every few years, every couple of years, election cycle comes up and there's some discourse, particularly in Arizona, about uh, you know, a prayer rug being found in the Sonoran Desert or you know, jihadist, cartel, jihadist uh, terrorist organizations linking up with the cartels. There's this book uh, that I've talked about before, uh, written by co-written by Thomas Morrissey and uh, former action star Steven Seagal called The Way of the Shadow Wolves. Um, and it's about cartels and jihadists teaming up to undermine the United States with the hope, with the help of the deep state and the president of the United States at the time, uh, a, a man named Hussein, which is a veiled reference at uh, President Obama, of course, and um, Joe Arpaio, uh, who used to be known as America's sheriff, pardoned by uh, President Donald Trump, et cetera, uh, wrote the foreword to that fiction and said, though this may be a work of fiction, it is but a hair's breadth from the truth. And so I also look at this, this migration and their stories, their real stories, in light of these conspiracy theories and these narratives about Muslim migrants at American borders and security and violence, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at right now, but that's very undercooked stuff at this point in time uh, for me as, as that's very early days. Thank you, that's awesome. I'd hey, love I to hear more once you're done. I have a question for you. Uh, now, <laughs> this uh, place is located in Tijuana. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's outside the U.S. Purdue. However, yeah. because of the new politics that prevent people to do, you know, to to uh, force them to stay in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in the United States, many religious groups uh, receive funding from the federal for that process of when you cross the border, getting into the border and send it somewhere else. You know, send it like a they bring them and they send it to it. Do you are aware if? Um, there is any work done to, because what is interesting about this, this particular center is that it's very religious or cultural based, you know? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's a machine that is construed uh, uh, Muslim. I mean, it, it, it dif differentiate them, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting. But then what happened when they go to the other side, if there is any uh, state intervention in uh, help them, or recognize differences, or promote, or inf inf infuse more differences on the body of the individuals. You know, um, yeah. because it's very interesting. I mean, religious group and migration and U.S. border. I mean, from the sanctuary movement that we have in the 1980s uh, into to who was religious space to today, uh, they still very much involved in that kind of practices. And many religious group, Catholic groups. Uh, the Caribbean area, I think, they have many migrant homes. It's called Casa Inmigrante, who mm -hmm. follow the, go all the way from Guatemala all the way here as a places to stop. Uh, so it, it will be interesting how this component has been used or not, or if the Mexican state do any intervention in that kind of sense. But it's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, think thinking about this place as a machine that is created, it's not only helping, but it's also creating, constructing mm -hmm. the subject, you know? Yeah. Fantastic. Sure, for sure. Yeah, thank you. I was writing down questions as you, as you raised them. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the questions could go on and on as we so quickly see, uh, but we're now 10 past the hour and, and people are starting to say goodbye. Um, and so unfortunately, I think we'll wrap things up this evening. Um, but thank you to everyone who was able to participate. Thank you to our sponsors and to our organizers uh, for all the work that they've done. 
Uh, Dr. Khan, would you like to close us off since you welcomed us in as well and uh, you were the, the main uh, centripetal force, force for bringing this, this conversation together? Um, sure. Thanks a lot, Ken, so much for that. I, want, I also want to say that was really a brilliant tying together of all of our work, um, and think, especially in thinking about diaspora. Uh, no, so just thank you to everyone for attending, um, and thank you to my fellow panelists, and you, Ken. And see you all at the next, next GISC event. Yeah. And if there is any other questions, send us emails, and we will be more than okay. happy to, yeah. to yeah. respond to them. Thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.